Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the wilds of magnificent northeastern South Africa here in the western fringes of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. Three and a half million hectares of Great African Wild. We are heading due south on Twin Dams Road. We've heard lions roaring. There were reports of that on the Juma Dam camp, so thank you for all of those. Uh, we're going at quite a speed to the south to see if we can't find the culprits that filled the night with their roars echoing up through the drainage lines and the woodlands of Juma private game reserve here on the western fringes like I say of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. You are with Wild Earth TV, this is Safari Live on Andrew, on, on Andrew we have camera, on camera we have Andrew, <laughs> my name is James Hendry and on the other vehicle uh, there is no one but on foot we have Brian and Brent uh, which may they may well be confused for a herd of giraffes, but later they will be walking around showing you the smaller, close-up things to do with the bush today. And in the final called Control, Tara and Louise. You are on a live safari, as many of you will know, and if you don't know, welcome to it. Hashtag Safari Live if you'd like to talk to us, ask us questions, and find out what we're doing. Questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to make any comments and questions as well if you're perhaps not tweeting just yet. Like I say, we heard lions calling just now. I think probably down near what we call Twin Dams, which is a dry sort of mud wallow at this particular stage of the season. And we're driving down there at quite a speed to see if we can't see them. It sounded like five males roaring. Perhaps the Birmingham boys have returned after a prolonged absence. Brent is going to go down the other side. And just exactly as Maggie is wondering, wondering what what is in store for us this morning, so am I. I'm very excited, there's always an expectation about the morning. Beautiful sunrise has just come up through a cold front that's sort of a sense of expectation all around. It will dissipate slowly as it gets a bit hotter, but hopefully it will deliver us the beautiful sight of those lions. Drive. But the elephant and the elephant. The lions of course can move as they like. So what we're gonna do is drive slowly from here. We'll switch off and have a listen just now, and then we're gonna head a little bit further off to the western side of the reserve. Andrew, you will tell me if you see any lions, won't you? Yes indeed. Thank you very much. I haven't seen any tracks on the road, and Brent thought they might be a little bit further west of here. So I just, he's going to go down that way, and maybe he's right. Because of uh, most likely anyone moving uh, heading south, we will nest uh, elephants at the junction. I'm just going to talk to Brent quickly uh, on the radio. I've um, uh, on no Gary tracks Main. of the lions also, just yet. We owed a visit from the lions. Uh, no tracks here yet. It's round here down that down I thought they were calling. Down. There's a giraffe. Uh, not yet. Okay. Sleeping, the giraffe's lying down. No, it's not lying down. There you go, beautiful giraffe. Morning, my love. Sorry, the car is moving around a bit. So, this is a good time to just stop and have a listen. That giraffe does not look particularly terrified by life, especially as he was lying down. So I don't think the lions were calling from right here. Now, the other thing that we will do at some stage today is head towards Biffleshook Dam, where we had that pack of dogs last night. And if you weren't with us yesterday, we had the most epic sighting. 
of some wild dogs that chased a Nyala cow or you into the water and they were running around the dam until it got very dark and eventually they just disappeared. It was just very special. Yeah, I'm going to the I'm going to check the I'm just sorry about the radio. It is supposed to be in my ear, but um, at the moment it isn't. Brent, come in. Um, I'm at Gari Main Junction Twin Dams. No sign here. Main. No sign here. I'm just going to check if there's road across um, here. Okay, copy that. Alright, now there's no sign of the lions here or to the west of us. And that is very interesting to me. Uh, it is uh, sad. But I thought that they were calling on Juma. So we'll just take a slow drive up towards the western side of this road. to sleep in our beds, thinking about various bits and pieces. Michelle and Kevin, you've given us lots of updates that the first time the lions were heard was around three o'clock this, this morning. Um, and then they seemed to fade and come back again and you thought perhaps up to four lions calling. I definitely heard them at about five o'clock this morning. Just, uh, sorry, about quarter to five. And Brent heard them now, as I started the engine when we were up there, he was still in camp. He heard them calling also around here, sort of now-ish. No tracks here at the moment. Thank you to all of you for your very kind birthday messages. It is, of course, my birthday today. I'm uh, 23 years old. What are you laughing at? Um, <laughs> very kind of you. And would, sir, you hope that I find myself a lilac dress and roller feather? I do too. Thank you very much. Andrew, why haven't you sung to me yet? Happy birthday ah, yeah. to you. <laughs> yes, carry on. That's it, sorry, guys. Ah, okay. Now, oh, there is Brent, I can see him. Difficult to miss is our Brent. But there are no tracks of anything in the way of large, very large cats. He has got tracks of what seems to be Tungana and Shadow, two leopards uh, that we couldn't find yesterday. He's got tracks of them. I'm definitely not going to spend too much time worrying about them. They were so nasty to us yesterday, we couldn't find them anywhere. I think what we might do is head off across towards Biffleshook Dam and see if those dogs aren't around there. If we can't find hide nor hair of the lions. I suspect unfortunately that they were further south than I last heard them. So we're on the boundary here, to the south of us is, um, I'm not sure of the, where the boundary is, Chitwa Chitwa or Hoffman's, and just north of us is Juma. Hello Brian. Hello James. How are you? Good and you. Full of joy. We see Brent there. Hello Brent. Brenty, we're going to go towards Cheetah Cut Line. So we'll turn around here, 
and we'll head off towards the far east. Brent will check this particular part and we'll see what we come up with. Good luck, Brian. What? Tracks. Crossing where? Right, maybe we should do a quick sojourn down the west here. If the leopard tracks are actually on the road, it might be worth doing. We don't want to get caught up, we do need to focus on one thing. One thing we noticed about old Rusty yesterday is that she does struggle to turn to the right. She's a got a propensity to only turn left. What do you want to do? Um, Why don't you follow these tracks? Okay. I'll turn around and go to Cheetah Cut Line. They found something? No. <laughs> but I'm hoping the line tr tracks may have come across there. Yeah. There's not There's not even a track on the road. Uh, if I had to bet money? Mm, just south of it. They're just here. Yeah. Bye right. everyone! Okay, buddy, you do that, I'll go to Cheetah Cut Line. Right. Let's let Brent follow these because he's closer to the ground being on foot. Uh, he's not closer to the ground when he's standing, of course, compared to me. But you know what I mean. Nice. On we go. Rusty's also giving a slightly disturbing smell of this morning. We'll forget about that. Alright, I'll see you just now. Enjoy. Ryan. And also, apparently, Lion's calling on the Arethusa Dam camera, uh, which is not too far from here, but it is far to the west. Thank you for that, Diane. Um, let's go and check here first, and if nothing, we don't come up with anything, we'll pop across to Arethusa and see if there isn't any update there. We'll also just have a little listen when we get onto the top of the ridge crest there and see if we can't hear. Because if there are lions calling at the Arethusa Dam, what will happen is that these ones will may well respond. reticent to turn the engine off, given that it wouldn't start this morning. Hmm. So this is where the giraffe was looking particularly unpanicked. So I am watching the road very carefully to see if there are any signs of tracks. Yet, glorious sunrise going on. about the rattling everyone. The road is a little bit uh, uneven.
Hello, how are you? Good, good. good. We're going to head up towards the Fusuk Dam. Okay. Just see if there isn't anything from last night. There were lions calling somewhere around here. They definitely haven't crossed this road though, so I don't know. Probably still in a little garage somewhere. Yeah, that's what it would seem to be. Who's following up on those Ingoing consort? Uh, Brent. Brent. He's there, yeah. You think, you think they've crossed? They, I don't know. They're going up and down the road. Yeah. Are you business? Uh, we business. Yeah, we business. See you, man. Perfect. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your drive. It's Craig from Cheetah Plains. Um, and just to confirm for Diane, Dara, and Larry, um, this new new vehicle, its name is Rusty. Um, named, I think, originally by VM. VM found a bit of rust, certainly uh, as the days progress and the uh, cosmetic paint job uh, starts to um, re reveal itself. Tracks of the wild dogs going to the north. Just listening. Nothing of great importance at this stage. Um, and if you wanted to know what that bar is across the front there. It is a it's it's the jack. It's part of a, a, a large high lift jack. A little distracting, we should perhaps paint it black. The jack of course is a very important part of our equipment. Starting to find a couple of little foibles with old with old Rusty the car. Um, yesterday I managed to put a gallon of oil into her. A gallon, that's five liters, into the engine. Uh, she still still seemed thirsty thereafter. Um, and Renos says, you want to know how much did I put in this morning? I didn't put any in this morning, and that is simply because there isn't any left. It all went into Rusty yesterday. I didn't even check. I thought if there isn't enough, well then we'll be in trouble. Great, coming great. There is an unanswerable question coming through about roads and one that I don't understand but I'm pretty sure that one of you, one of you clever people will know. Jan, you want to know from Philadelphia what causes that washboarding on the roads? So those ridges, those regular ridges. I'm going to say that what it is, is that it's a resonance caused by um, the shock absorbers on vehicles and so and the reason it all happens at the same time is that once, once it starts, all other sh shock absorbers coming along the same road and often at speed will create the same resonance with their shock absorbers and that creates that kind of washboarding and, you know, the bumping along the place. So, but if somebody else has got a better answer, I'd really actually be fascinated to know what it causes, what causes it. There you go, Andrew. How do you like our aerial design? Dirty. Robust. And I, I did cast aspersions on poor old Brent last night. Um, I, I mentioned that the, the aerial on Wendy had snapped off. And I had great visions of Brent charging through the bush at 100 miles an hour as he followed up on the wild dogs hitting a tree and cutting the aerial off halfway. Ooh, apparently there are lions roaring somewhere around the Juma Dam as well at the moment. I'm just going to get hold of Brent. Brent, did you copy that? Brent, Brent, do you copy? Anyway, switch off there. 
Brent, apparently um, more line audio from the Juma Dam cam. Any, did you hear anything there? Switch off and listen. Negative, sorry, I was mobile, um, but I was not heading towards that area. Uh, update on those Ingram Gonzal, they have crossed south. Ah, about the leopard has gone south. Fifty meters uh, to the west of uh, Weaver's Nest Junction with Gary uh, Mayer. Okay, copy that. Are you going to do um, for Lawrence cut line? Uh, I firm I'm at Treehouse now. I'll do Solomon's cut line. Down okay. The Thank now. you very much for that update. Uh, we will definitely follow up. I'm going to continue up here and then turn back towards the, the west. Oh dear. Oh, this is not good. <laughs> Come on, Rusty. Come on, old girl. Come, Rusty. Come on, Rusty. You go, go, Rusty. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. We will we will try and fire up this car properly. Um, this is not, of course, the most entertaining live television in the world. Uh, but let's see if we can't uh, make something out of it. Much oil, no, I don't think it's got <laughs> anything to do with the oil, you pretty. <laughs> to be brutally honest, I feel that Rusty is a lemon. <laughs> Rusty, Rusty, apart from the very fine cosmetic paint job she has. I'm going to let things calm down here a bit. I'm going to find some interesting piece of biology to show you. We will try and get Brent up and running so that you can be entertained rather by him than me trying to start the car. Uh, what can we see? Stand by. Right, well there's some dung here. Interesting dung. And this is actually quite interesting. I'll bring it over. It's also not a bad thing that we're able to stop and listen just to check and see if lions don't call again. This is zebra dung. Ooh. Not warm. Still moist though. I think uh, given the fact that Rusty is clearly so incompetent, I'm not going to worry about putting fresh dung on her dashboard. That is fresh zebra dung, and what is interesting to note about it is the difference between it and a ruminant's dung. Now, <laughs> I've got some ruminant dung here, stand by. So a zebra is what we call a hindgut fermenter. It does not re-chew its food like this ruminant does here. This is a piece of old buffalo dung. And um, you know, if you're a connoisseur of fine dung, you'll be able to notice a big difference here. Um, turn it to the sun slightly so that you can see. The buffalo dung on the right-hand side is much more finely chewed than the zebra dung to the left and that is because it's been chewed twice and it's much much denser this is just like horse dung um, bits and pieces you'll find I'm not going to fuss it through it with my fingers because it's a little bit wet uh, which is a bit foul for one's birthday but definitely larger pieces than you'll find in this buffalo dung here isn't that fascinating Andrew mm -hmm. wonderful right shall we see if Rusty will start Yes, yes, come on. There you go. Yes, yes. Not that. Okay, we're off. Whew. Sorry about that, everyone. What can 
one do. Right, we're on our way. We'll forget about that little um, hiccup, should we say. Head towards the Bifelsrug Dam and see what we can come up with. Unfortunately, Aubrey has found the wild dog tracks, but they are heading north into Bifelsrug. That's not to say they won't come back. So yesterday evening, the reason we're heading towards the Bifflesrook Dam was we had that incredible sighting of wild dogs. Three adults and 11 pups of just over three months old now were knocking about. The first time I've seen the pups actually on the hunt, as opposed to waiting for the adults. And they chased a Nyala into the water. There is some buffalo. There are some buffalo, sorry. Calling English. And you say when? When? Well, I'm going to turn the car off, I'm afraid. Um, and the Nyala then went into the water and it spent an extended period of about an hour and a half, two hours actually at the end of it, in the water, sort of watching carefully for three hippo that looked like they might attack it. And then well, the dogs ran around and around waiting for the Nyala to come out. Came out once and the dogs chased it again and the, it was just about pitch black dark. Nyala turned around and ran back into the water and eventually the dogs moved off. And as far as we know, the Nyala, well we know that the Nyala then came out of the water. It was so dark and we didn't want to put a light on it. So dark. Nyala came out of the water and was not eaten last night. Whether, you know, what else happened after that we're not sure. So Blair in Ontario, um, Nyala came out the water, wasn't eaten while we were there. And these buffalo, of course, had absolutely nothing to do with that particular situation. They are sitting relieved to have made it through the night. They're probably not in the slightest bit upset that the lions are not particularly close to this area. And they are quietly chewing the cud after their early morning graze. And of course, buffalo bulls live beyond breeding age. Very few animals do that. And I think that the reason that buffalo bulls do is that they draw attention away from the herds and they draw from by predators. So those big five, those five big male lions um, from the Birmingham boys, were they to come across these buffalo bulls, they may well, you know, take one and eat it. Now the buffalo bulls are still f f uh, What's the? I've lost the word. They're a formidable, formidable enemy for any lion, and even those five males will struggle to take down one of these old boys. But I think it does draw attention away from the cars and cows in the herd, which play a much more important role, of course, in furthering the species. And there, is cleverly spotted by Andrew, is a starling, a greater blue-eared glossy starling, eating and termites from the termite mound. They're beautiful bird and so lovely in the light. Beautiful iridescent green, purple, blue. Lovely. Hmm. Right, well uh, Andrew, I think we should probably try and fire up the engine again, don't you? No, 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 no. It did start, but it's, uh, it's given up again, I'm afraid. I don't think we're going to turn it off again. Should we call it a risky instead of rusty? Risky, risky. yes. Risque. Or rubbish. <laughs> Maybe we should just call him rubbish. <laughs> it rolls off the tongue. Right? It does roll off the tongue. <laughs> Okay, right. Thank, th thank, th thank you. Thankfully, Brent seems to be up and running or walking. Certainly, let's head across to him. I'm going to take to this car with a um, crowbar, and I'll see you just now.
Uh, there we go. I think I think you should be able to hear me now. Sorry about that. And so normally we would be walking, but what we do in this first little bit, especially if there's lions calling and uh, lion tracks around, is we'll try to get into an area of that. So those other lions are south. The leopard tracks have crossed out of our area, and we just heard a report of lion calling around the Juma Dam. So we've moved to this area. But oh my goodness gracious me! One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, eight giraffe. Isn't this wonderful? Let's just move forward. There's some wonderful interaction going on there. These young males courting. I think they're lucky there's no big male around, I think. They're a bit too young to be courting females, if there was a big male around. So, oh, having a little bit of a gallop, a play, a silly five minutes. So Brian is doing an outstanding job here, being a, a human tripod from the vehicle. Ah, now there's a bull on the left who is old enough to be courting the ladies. But actually you see that, that little one doesn't like the male courting, which is probably its mother. Oh no, there's another, just some, some galloping giraffe. And when they're defending themselves against lions, they use those front feet in a very similar fashion, obviously kicking them out quite a lot forward. Oh, fun and games this morning. Full of the joy of life, these giraffe. And it's so nice to have a nice big group of giraffe that we're seeing so regularly around quarantine. Those two on the far right seems like they've spotted something on the other side of the clearing. Oh, uh, he's more interested in the females, obviously. Not a predator. Now, giraffe mating is a very, very short process over in a matter of seconds. And you probably find it's developed like that to help save the female from having to carry the huge weight of the male on her back for an extended period. It's literally on and off. Ah, there we go. We can see. I can see what those giraffe were looking at. Now there's some wildebeest to the right of them. Here we go. Wildly beasts. Just gonna first. Oh, wait, wait, here comes the herd. You can see them stopping and rubbing their pre -aut orbital glands against that tree. A form of scent marking. Right, there are those lions calling again to the south, well south of our boundary. Those, are, I think, are different from the audio we heard earlier. Oh, looks like the wildebeest are about to have a silly five minutes. Very short little gallop there.
or those two young male giraffe are going to have a bit of a play fight, practice fight thing there. It's very not serious. But here we go. You can see in very slow motion <laughs> how they would fight. Here we go. But obviously now speed that up and add great force to it. And that's what a giraffe fight looks like. Very, very slow motion, this one. <laughs> and no real menace to it, more just playing between the two young males. And you can imagine with that long neck, they can actually build up quite a head of speed. And when they do hit each other, you can hear it from sometimes up to a kilometer away. She's reaching for, looking for some leaves of that marula tree. And I think she's eaten all the low ones. What a peaceful scene here on the quarantine clearings. We look at those two young boys at the back there. Not really serious and not really hitting each other too hard. But Boyd in North Carolina was wondering what a giraffe's horns used for. They are used for fighting. Oh, look at this female. She's going to try to use that long tongue to try grab those. There we go. You've finished everything else, madam. There's not much there left. So, boy, they are used for fighting in the males. They're used as battering rams to, with that long neck, swing at sort of high speeds. And they have been known to actually kill each other while they've been fighting and do some serious damage. It's an incredibly strong animal. Oh, there we go. Reaching again. It's just too far. <laughs> got that dawn chorus going crested franklins cape turtle doves Black-headed oriole, emerald-spotted wood dove. And there's two young boys again, still play sparring. Almost looks like they're dancing when giraffe fight. Distance. Just gonna have a sit up and see whether they're just snorting for snorting's sake or they've actually spotted something. Looks like they're just snorting for snorting's sake. 
Yeah, this Females come very close to us. And two young boys stepping it up a little bit. Obviously, it is play or practice at the moment, but it is going to, it will develop into quite a violent affair as they get older. Look how they're trying to trip each other. And as we watch these two youngsters spar, GJ in Southern California is wondering, do they ever break their necks? Uh, when they are fighting seriously, that they do. Uh, it is uncommon, but it, it, it has been recorded before. As we watch these two boys play sparring and you can notice that their horns are starting to develop. Ooh. Um, sorry, we can't, it's behind the vehicle, but there's some running. There's an amorous male chasing a female. Let's move it and go see what they're up to. Um, but while we're doing that, Thelma, from West Dam in Michigan was asking, do females fight like males? Uh, no, they don't, Thelma. They don't have to compete for mating. Oh, it looks like we might get some bigger male on male action. So there's two males now showing interest in the same female. Just gonna get us into the right spot. Oh, that was a very civilized takeover there. One just walked in between and the other walked away. So. This male who is standing next to the female now, just sort of when that running started uh, with the other male, which is, he's just off to the left. He just walked in between the two and saw off the competition. There we go, we can see he's just walking him off. I, I think there's, oh, he's having a scratch. Um, I think there's probably a female who's about to come into estrus, just judging from all the movement and behavior around. There we go, he's seeing off the competition. Oh, he's saying hello to the little one. So when giraffes are active like this, which doesn't happen that often, they are a very fascinating creature to watch. Yeah, that beautiful chortle of a black-headed oriole. There we go. There's a giraffe snort, not something you hear too often. Oh, here we go again. One male moving in. Let's see what the other does. I 
You can see him coming in from behind. Is he going to see off the would-be suitor? Yes, he is. In a very non, non, non-violent way. But if the would-be suitor didn't move away, you could find a little bit of more aggression. And another male that's just arrived behind me on the scene, but he's a bit younger than these two. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Silly five minutes, baby giraffe at full gallop. Just for fun. Beautiful, cool morning. All the animals seem to be in good spirits. Well, particularly that young giraffe. We've got two juvenile males there, sub-adults. Well, as is, we often see giraffe when they're, they're just eating or, or ruminating. We don't... Oh, oh, off again! No, not quite. Um, and Claire from the big apple saying, isn't it wonderful? And she didn't realize how flexible their necks are and what such a wide range of movement they have. It is incredible, an animal like that size with that very strange shape. And here comes another young male, are capable of, of such an array of movement. <laughs> Let's see if he gallops back to mom. Is it a he or a she? I can't really see yet, it's a bit young. In my binoculars. It could be a she, but I need to wait for it to turn side on. Yeah, it's a she. And those young boys on the spar again. So different young males arrived and started up with the sparring. Well, let's see, we've got three giraffe there. The youngster is four, five, six, seven. I know yesterday in the middle of the day, I counted 13 giraffe from quarantine clearings, which is by far the biggest group I've ever seen at Juma. And these are part of that group. I think we had eight so far this morning. There could be a few more around. I'm just going to try to roll forward so those giraffe aren't behind the bush. And we can see the young males at the tops of the horns are already losing the hair. And that is from these games that they're playing at the moment. Hope you guys are getting some great screenshots. And that clicking is just me grabbing my camera, getting my version of a, a screen grab. And don't forget to post those on our Wild Earth Facebook page. And or just use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter.
Ooh. And you can also see not only do they go for each other's necks, they go for each other's legs, obviously. It, it's probably a lot easier to break a leg than a neck on a giraffe. But again, this isn't very serious. And you can see how they, they widen their stance to become more stable when they do that. So they spread their legs a little bit. Oh, stuck in a tree. <laughs> These were probably what we would call teenagers. Just testing each other out. Practice for the big leagues in a few years. So with evolution, There's two, almost all um, evolutionary advancements are to do with two things. Uh, one is competition for food and the other is mating. And long, for a long time, people have considered giraffes long neck as a food competition thing. But there's quite a lot of new interesting research that is, is sort of disproving it. Obviously it is an aid, but basically gir giraffes necks have become longer and longer uh, for sexual competition and for fighting. So the giraffe with a longer neck is able to draw more sort of momentum from the swing and therefore hit harder than a giraffe with a shorter neck. So there's quite a big school of thought who's now thinking that, that the giraffe's long neck is far more for sexual competition than it is for food competition. It is beautiful, it is almost like a dance, a ballet. These guys keep getting their heads stuck in that terminalia. So, very serious fights uh, will only really happen when a female's in full estrus and there's two big males, adult males around. And they can last up to an hour and two hours even. But normally they're over in about half an hour, 45 minutes. And the victor is, will take his mating rights and the loser will just move off of the vanquished. See how they go for the knees? Or what would be a giraffe knee? Oh, good one. Got in there in between the legs, in the rib cage. And they're not hitting very hard. We can see they, how flexible they are and how much movement they have. And Clay is wondering, would they band together to fight off a lion? I have seen it before, and especially if there's a young individual like the one that's here, which is sort of one of a, a lion's favorite foods, a bite-sized giraffe. Uh, they would band together and they would try to chase the lions away from that youngster. But like with buffalo, it doesn't happen every time. Sometimes they'll just run away. We're just going to move. Oh wait, no, they're moving back out the side. <laughs> Trying to make sure they're not hiding behind the tree all the time. I think if we go forward a bit, we should get a better view. Yeah, the rusty bed springs of a Koki Franklin. <laughs> Calling somewhere in these little terminalias. So we've got a 
a name we don't and we haven't heard before so a very big welcome to Tasmanian Devil I wonder if you live in Australia by chance uh, so welcome to Safari Live and Tasmanian Devil is wondering or could I just call you Taz for short like the cartoon uh, is wondering how we tell the gender difference in giraffe well here we have two young males if we look at their horns or ossicones which is the correct word for a giraffe's horns uh, the males do not even at this young age do not have hair on top of their horns the horns are far more robustly built than the females and that is for fighting the females have a full sort of hair covering them a full set of hair covering them and are much much more delicately built Unfortunately, there are no females in sight at the moment, just these two young males. The females have moved off. coming down from that height and spreading your legs to have a drink of water uh, all that blood rushing down from, from, from a height into their, their brain would cause them to pass out so I'm guessing that valve also plays quite an important role when they're fighting to stop blood rushing to the head when it gets lower How we watch these two little guys oh there's a little bit of dominance ploy uh, you find that quite often in male animals in the bush they will try and mount each other for dominance but Anna Marie says she's watched some videos of these of giraffe fights that become very very tangled I'll uh, be very very uh, brutal and she's wondering do their necks ever become tangled Anna Marie, uh, they don't. Oh, there we go. There's that little dominance ploy. Uh, I've never ever heard of a giraffe's neck becoming tangled. Broken, yes. Broken legs, yes. Broken ribs, but never tangled. So, out here we've got lots of different animals and Marie Anne's wondering do giraffe ever chase vehicles like elephants? Well Marie Anne, if you drive properly around elephants they shouldn't chase you and since I've been at Juma how many months now? Eight months? Seven months? With uh, Wild Earth I've never been chased by an elephant or a giraffe but yes elephants do occasionally chase vehicles uh, but giraffe do not and they would much rather move away than chase the vehicle well, looks like the sparring slowing down a bit and with teenagers like this this sort of half serious half play can go on for quite a long time I think they're going to realize they've been left behind by the rest of the giraffe quite shortly and then they'll probably just move off to join them and this is quite a power play going on between these two each one keeps walking around to try and mount the other oh I think they've just realized where's everyone oh no but I can't lose My turn. <laughs> oh no, you don't. I'm too fast for you.
So at the moment the giraffe on the right seems to have a deformed ossicone or horn uh, or bent and well done to Rick and Susie and quite a few others for noticing that and that's probably a defect from birth um, having a look at it through the binos and you do see that sometimes with a lot of animals out here I don't think it's going to negatively affect him at the moment it might oh there we go a full mount serious dominance going on there so quite interesting that ossicone having a look that looks definitely like a birth defect I don't think that's happened afterwards round and round the garden <laughs> getting dizzy watching these guys well uh, well one walks forward one walks backwards according to Jennifer in Toronto it looks like a Texas two-step I'm afraid Jennifer I have no idea what a Texas two-step is um, speaking of uh, people from Canada, a little bit earlier on the Sunrise Safari, we met Judy, who's a regular viewer of ours, who's staying at Arethusa at the moment. So we said a quick hello to her, and I'm sure some of you guys out there might know her. So we have quite a varied set of pregnancies out here in the bush, uh, the elephant being the longest at 22, 23 months. And generally the bigger the animal, the longer the pregnancy outside of the primate world. Uh, animals like us, for our size, have a very long pregnancy and so do a lot of the primates and that's to let the brain develop. So we've got far more cognitive function than most animals. Um, but Charlotte from Denmark who's also a new viewer or new to asking questions at least so welcome Charlotte and please keep sending in questions is wondering how long a giraffe's pregnancy is and it is one of the longer ones and what I'm going to do oh just hang on a second Just, sorry, I thought I saw something behind those giraffe. Uh, Charlotte, I will get back to your question in a second. And when young males are doing stuff like this, if there are lions in the area, they can be quite vulnerable because they're not focusing on checking for predators. What was that? I just saw a very tawny shape move behind the giraffe on the other side of that little drainage line I mean most likely it's going to be something like a kudu or an impala but it's worth definitely worth checking carefully did you see it Brian? I mean, if it was a lion, there would definitely have to be, if it was a lioness, there'd definitely have to be more than one to take on a giraffe, even a small giraffe like this. It would have, definitely have to be a pride. Although I have seen two males take on a huge male giraffe by themselves and succeed.
lines to, to, to hunt. And you do get prides that specialize in it. Actually, I think I can see that now. And it is a false alarm. It looks like a, a kudu that's just moved through. I can't just pass through very briefly, but it's disappeared. Um, but they kick very quickly. And we're gonna just finish finished, um, on Charlotte's, Charlotte's uh, a question, which I got sidetracked from, uh, which was the gestation period of a giraffe. It, as I said, it's one of the long ones. It's over a year. It's 400 to 460 days. So a very long gestation. And speaking of baby giraffe, uh, let's see what James has got. Hello everyone, you've been having a marvellous time with Brent and apparently what has been described by Tara Dales as the greatest giraffe sighting in the history of giraffe sightings. We've come to a little spot here, not too far from where Brent is, but there is, there are two tiny giraffe here. One, that one there that you're looking at is about three months old, I think. And they seem to be without any form of adult supervision. We're just going to carry on around the corner here and have a quick look at them. And we'll take you back to Brent if anything further develops there. Having a wonderful time around there. So maybe the adults are around the corner here. And then they were frolicking around here on the clearing when we got here. But why their parents are not around, I'm not sure. Oh, there's... Is that another one, Andrew? No, I think it's just a tree. <laughs> Cantering off. another one behind it. Oh, there we go. There's mother. There we go. <laughs> Look at this little one. Has it having a little leap up and down and it's so wonderful to watch them run and Gilly in Wisconsin you were just saying exactly the same thing that it's amazing to watch them run it does look like they're running in slow motion they have huge feet Gilly you want to know how big they are um, if you were to look at that little ones there uh, he's probably got a sort of size human size 10 the others the, the, big, bu um, the big bulls would have feet roughly the size I suppose of a standard issue soup bowl um, that's probably about the size I'll show you with my hands when we come back out from this little chap um, probably about that long that's what the tracks look like on the ground so pretty pretty good length and they do look like they're running in slow motion but they aren't I mean they run very quickly let's just have a let's keep in on the little one there he's frolicking about he's it's quite chilly today. There's an unusual kind of coldness about, and I'm sure that's why this little one is running around more than it would normally, and also why you had that amazing sighting with Brent of the giraffe knocking about the place and sort of play fighting and, and running around. It's caught by some pretty gorgeous light at the moment. Now these are the two that I... Did we see them last night? They're not the same ones that we saw yesterday. No, they're not. Uh, what is interesting here is that these two I've seen before and I think that kind of the little one that's looking at us now, you can see its umbilical cord perhaps is still sticking out of below its belly. And that's three months, which means that little thing is not quite three months yet. You want to know about seasonality in giraffe breeding? Do they breed during a specific season? They are not particularly seasonal breeders. They're probably you'll find that there's a peak, 
around the wet season so sort of November December January but as you can see this one was born in the heart of the winter time and has done very well I'd say that's unusual um, but yeah it's they're not seasonal breeders particularly like say Impala let me just sneak a little bit forward and see if we can't see the other one. Now, what we were watching just now, of course, was a little bit of a demonstration of the defensive mechanisms that giraffe employ. So that little one that was stamping its feet up and down like that, that's how they defend themselves against predators. Giraffe will lift their rear up onto their back legs and stamp down with their front legs. They can kick with their back legs as well. And I've seen tremendous footage of lions being fairly severely injured by giraffe's front feet. And Liz, oh, I think it's, is it Liz? Sorry, I've, I've lost, my, lost my train of thought, but a question coming out of Los Getos, California. And that was, sounds like a fun place to be. Um, do they bite each other in defense as well? That's Charlene. Charlene, um, not as far as I know, there's not a great deal of biting. Uh, they might do a little bit of aloe grooming, uh, and that means that they would groom each other, so they'll sort of pick ticks off each other or give each other a scratch every so often. And there are lots of animals that do that to t confirm social bonding. But in terms of biting each other, no, not really. They don't have a, a particularly strong set of teeth for biting. Uh, the only herbivores that really use their teeth as a particularly effective and vicious form of defense would be zebra that I know of. They uh, do a lot of biting. The one just in front of us there, peeping out from the trees. But that one having a grazing giraffe, that's extremely bizarre. Oh look, picking up a bone. Wow, look at that. Picking up a bone. That is not uncommon everybody, but you read about it, you seldom see it. They're picking up a bone and sucking it for phosphorus. That's apparently why they do it. They need a lot of phosphorus. I'm not sure why they're deficient in phosphorus. That's why they pick up bones and they often suck them. And you often you watch giraffe, they wander about the place. They don't seem to, they, 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 then they move off in one direction and they seem to be communicating, but we often don't know how. And Bree and Claire, um, question about how they communicate, do they communicate, do they make a, no, a noise. Bree, Terry and Claire, Tree, Tree, Terry and Claire, um, question about whether they communicate. Oh, I Cree, Terry and Claire, perhaps, sorry, I'm just missing this, um, missing the name here. Anyway, you want to know about how they eat. Um, oh, not how they eat, how they communicate. I've totally got myself in total fluster here. Um, <laughs> they make, the, you heard them grunting earlier. Now, for a long time, we thought giraffe were completely silent. That is becoming less and less the case as we study their behavior. You've heard them grunting. I have heard a cow giraffe making a bellowing noise at a leopard that was trying to eat her young baby uh, that had died of natural causes. And as that leopard came up to try and uh, sort of make off with the young, young calf, she, was, she made a horrible bellowing noise. We also think that they communicate infrasonically. Now, that might sound slightly more mysterious than it actually is. Uh, elephants do it. They are able to communicate in a frequency that is just we can't hear. So their voice boxes will make various sounds that are too low 
for our ears to pick up. So we think that that's how giraffe, that's the kind of sound that giraffe make. They also will snort in alarm sometimes. That little one on the left hand side of your screen is just has the most wonderful um, wonderful coloration I think I've ever seen on a giraffe. You may also have noticed the one that picked up the bone has lost its tail. Now that could have been to hyenas, it could have been to lions, it could also and most, most likely have been to ticks. Ticks often eat away the top of the tail and if the giraffe isn't particularly careful it can become infected and the tail will then come off eventually. Uh, it can't be very, it must be extremely painful I imagine. And it does come off. But certainly it's possible that it was a predator and while it was running away the lion, or possibly a lion, got hold of the tail and it kind of snapped off. It will not grow back. It is not like a lizard. Very strange atmosphere today, kind of a breezy cool, cool air. And these giraffes are so inquisitive. I'm sure you saw that with Brent. I'm not sure if he was on foot or if he was in his vehicle, but um, those giraffe, once they get interested in something, it's wonderful to see them kind of walking around and coming closer and looking and investigating and enjoying, almost enjoying a sighting of uh, people. And if you're on foot, that is especially the case. If, you've got on, if you're on foot ever in Africa, if you ever find yourself out here um, and you're on foot and you find some giraffe, it's well worth actually spending an hour or two just sitting in front of them or even lying down on the ground in front of them. They'll come right up to you to have a look. I've had a giraffe investigating me from about hmm, maybe one and a half meters. I was lying on the ground watching it and it came up to within a, one and a half meters, put its head down to try and kind of sniff me and see what I was doing. And that little thing is just fascinated by us. I'm always amazed at the stockiness of the shoulders and the legs. And that, of course, is, is crucial. That giraffe has to get up and run as a youngster. It must be born and within half an hour it must be steady on its feet and able to run. Otherwise it will become a meal extremely quickly. People often ask how you age animals and how you age giraffe and certainly when they, these giraffes are born um, it takes about a week for those horns of theirs to stand up. They're born flat on the head which is totally ridiculous and then after a few days they start to stand up and within a week they are standing up and after a few weeks they're fused onto the skull and you don't ever see a kind of gap between them again. And then the other good way, Anna Marie, to um, age a giraffe calf is by that little piece of umbilical cord which lasts until it's three months old. So if you know that, if you can see the umbilical cord, you know that the giraffe is probably not yet quite three months. It might last a little bit longer in some and a little bit shorter in others. So see, we're we'll chatting about this Aussie cones or horns, um, and they stick up when they're a few days old and they fuse to the skull. And of course, the difference between the males and the females is that the males start to go bald, uh, a bit like some of us, Andrew and I, or me more so than Andrew, of course. Um, and while we don't have Aussie cones, a bull giraffe has 
these bald horns and Georgiana in Illinois you want to know when it is that those horns start to go bald it's pretty much when they start fighting so they'll start necking each other or and, and giraffe necking is entirely different from human necking um, they'll start bashing each other like he was watching with Brent um, as soon as they get into kind of sub-adulthood and so once that starts it'll wear the wear away the hair on top of the horns and so I would say probably at about mm, maybe four or five years they'll start to go bald right let's go across to Brent he's on foot different angle more intimacy uh, on foot in the bush and so he will show you a few things at the old hyena den I'll continue from here Hey everyone, have a look around the front. The hyena den here. And, oh, I think I know why you can't hear me. Okay, can you hear me now? And we're right here with uh, one of the old hyena dens. And it has been used before the last one. And so I think the new hyena den is within about 200 meters of here. So we've decided on this morning's walking safari to try to find the new hyena den. I know how excited uh, a lot of you guys get when we do find the dens and we get to see those awesome little guys uh, around the den site and that incredible interaction. So we're going to walk around hopefully. And one of the main reasons I know this den is not active is that I'm not covered in fleas. So if this den was active and I walked up to it, I would literally see all the fleas on my legs. But it is incredible to get close enough to have a look into these holes. And unfortunately, I forgot my torch, so we can't show you inside. Well, that is a... Really, really nice little update. While we're looking for the hyena den, we've got a, an update from Chris Rogue, who says there's a hyena at the Jimmer Dam Camp right now. But we're gonna send you off back to Commander Bond. But before we do that, uh, there's actually, it's quite an important day uh, at Wild Earth today. Uh, one of our team members is having a birthday. So sing along with us. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Commander Bond, happy birthday to you. Hooray! 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 I think it's a great pity that Brian didn't sing loud more loudly there. Uh, Brent, by his own admission, is completely tone deaf. There are very few people in the world that are tone deaf. Brent is one of them, unfortunately. Uh, but very, the sentiment is much, much appreciated from both of them. Uh, lovely to have a, a song live. Uh, well, disconcerting at a hyena den, perhaps. But uh, much appreciated, thank you, on the occasion of my 23rd birthday. We are now heading south towards Impala Plains. You did hear there was reports of lions calling earlier from the Juma Dam. We haven't found the track of a lion yet on Juma. The Unkohuma Pride, good news everyone, is on Torchwood. And all five lionesses, don't know where Junior's gone, uh, but they're okay. Telamati Pride's gone north of Manjaleti. We don't know where the Salala Pride is. Um, so we are just going to look around here because if you could hear the lions from the Juma camera, it's just unlikely that they would be so far away that they wouldn't be on the property. So we'll look around for further tracks. Maybe that microphone's better than I think it is. And if we don't find any tracks fairly soon, we'll just pop across to Arethusa and see if there's anything going on there. Um, obviously, we had the lions calling close to the Arethusa Dam. I'm pretty sure those guys would have found the lions there. Let's say a very chilly breeze blowing through. 
unseasonally so. big thank you. I believe that the uh, well-wishers continue to wish me a happy birthday on the Twitter sphere. Thank you very much. That is very kind of you. Makes me feel like a celebrity. Um, and <laughs> and Janet would like all the animals to come out and greet me in force. Janet. I share that sentiment profoundly. I hope that they eventually do come out and greet me in force. Likewise, thank you for your advice in dealing with our car, our new car called Rusty. Um, Andrew and I threw about the name ZB. Maybe we should call Rusty ZB. ZB is the uh, Zulu word uh, for rubbish. At the moment we'll leave it with Rusty. It seems to be behaving okay. So, lions on a day like today, because it's quite cold, will look for the sun. And so it's quite nice to just check around all the clearings and see if there isn't some sign of them, um, especially given that they were heard from the Juma Dam camera.